In our fifth session of our series on purpose, we're moving forward into the realm of discipleship. And there are two factors in this realm that are extremely important. One is that the instant we encounter the realm of discipleship, we encounter the cross. The other is that the further we advance in our Christian growth and development, the more important it is for us to be very sure of our doctrine that we are walking in line with the truth that our growth is based upon truth as it is set forth in the word in these days especially doctrine is being pushed aside by so many many who should know better so much today is experience centered and of course when one begins to concentrate upon experience the doctrinal basis for one's life begins to fade out of the picture but doctrine is all important one's life one's experience one's true experience can be no better than the truth of his doctrine that he holds there must be correct knowledge and it is this knowledge of the truth that the Holy Spirit takes and makes real in one's life and doctrine true doctrine should never be belittled in any way it should be valued highly we must walk according to the truth And doctrine has to do with growth, doctrine has to do with service, doctrine has to do with discipleship, doctrine has to do with the truth of the cross. And some of these points we want to touch on during this time together. Doctrine is important in any realm. Doctrine is all important in the realm of music. One must have the basic principles, the doctrines of music before one can advance. And the more clearly and the truer one has his doctrinal basis, the better he'll be able to advance and this is also, of course, true in mathematics. If one is not established on the basic principles, firmly established, <coughs> understandingly established, the advance will be sporadic and <coughs> it will not be strong and clear and it will be limited. The advance will be limited to the extent that the foundation is sound and correct. Every realm, even in the realm of marriage, even in the realm of everyday Christian life, Christian growth. And in this matter of growth and development, maturity for the Christian, if we turn to Second Peter 1, there are two verses here, several verses here that we can look at that are very valuable. Second Peter 1, 2-4 to four. Where Peter says, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, 
whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature. And we can spend some time here in this truth, get to know it better. This <clears throat> word multiplied is important, grace and peace be multiplied unto you. How? Through the knowledge of God and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have touched upon this principle before, that we can only trust God to the extent that we know him. Knowledge is all important. We can only rest in, uh, in the Lord Jesus and depend upon him to the extent of our knowledge of him. And our growth depends upon our knowledge. First, it's head knowledge as we study the Word, as the Holy Spirit gives us truth through our mind. And then, of course, He uh, works this truth down into our heart and life as He takes us through uh, everyday experiences. The study and the daily experience are geared together by the Holy Spirit so that our head knowledge and our heart knowledge go together. They may be separated in a matter of time. Our head knowledge may come first, and it should. But the result of correct head knowledge will result, the result will be in uh, the Lord's time, heart knowledge, a very part of our actual daily life. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. And uh, as we see how God that does everything on the basis in the principle of grace <clears throat> this will save us from being enslaved by the law and by self-effort as we really come to know the depths and the wonders of grace <clears throat> and of course as we get to know this truth and we get to know the Lord Jesus better and God better our Father peace will come peace is predicated upon our knowledge of the Lord Jesus and what he has done on our behalf and how that he has cleared the way and that in him we are accepted fully accepted by God and that we're complete in the Lord Jesus this fact these facts the realization of these truths this doctrine brings peace to one's heart and as one uh, learns to walk in the grace of the Lord Jesus and one uh, rests and has peace one is in the condition to grow. One's heart is in condition to uh, receive what the Lord has for us. And we grow and develop. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. And that's the wonderful truth to know that we are complete in the Lord Jesus Christ and that he's our life and that all that we'll ever need for our development and our growth and our maturity both here and in eternity all of this is already ours in the Lord Jesus we're complete in him everything that pertains unto life and godliness the Lord Jesus is our life he is life and of course the godliness comes from him righteousness and truth and glory already ours in Christ we are accepted and complete in him and as we grow the Holy Spirit gives us these things that belong to us in Christ the life of the Lord Jesus is more thoroughly developed in us and uh, manifest through us that is our growth and our development our processing as self is dealt with and held in the place of death inoperative the Lord Jesus is free to manifest himself so that is the principle of growth, not I, but Christ, and it is a progressive matter, growth. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. And here is our knowledge again, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. As we get to know him, that I may know him, <clears throat> as he takes us through things, as we uh, struggle and uh, fail and see something more and more of self, the hunger and the need is built up in our lives that we 
reach out to him and appropriate him and uh, study and get to know him, understand him, the knowledge of him, and he has called us to glory and virtue, a life that will glorify him and a life that is uh, upstanding and uh, Christian and virtuous and uh, clean in this poor sin-sick world. And now we're brought back to truth, to doctrine in this matter of growth, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these he might be made, might be partakers of the divine nature. And God has told us in the word, he's given his uh, promise in all of these different areas, what he has already done for us, what he is going to give us, what he has given us in the Lord Jesus Christ. And God stands behind his promises. And as we get to know him better and trust him more fully, we are able to rest in his promises and exercise faith in the truth of the word and really believe him. We were saved by faith. Uh, certainly it was a babe faith. It was a birth faith. It was very simple in comparison to the faith that is needed for growth. Many Christians are seeking to get along on the amount of faith, so to speak, that they exercised when they were saved. But there is much greater faith uh, necessary when it comes to growth, when it comes to entering into the deeper truths. So that we have to get to know him better and uh, so that we have a better foundation so to speak upon which to exercise our faith because faith biblical scriptural faith has to have facts upon which to rely faith is not some general effort to believe faith is simply seeing the facts seeing the promises seeing the truth seeing the doctrine and resting upon it that is exercising faith in what God has said that by these promises you might be partakers of the divine nature, that we might grow, that the Lord Jesus might be ever more fully uh, in control and manifesting himself in us. So these wonderful verses are indeed something for the Christian to hide away in his heart and to meditate upon for many, many months, years, as the Holy Spirit <coughs> gives one more and more of the riches of these truths. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be made, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature. So growth is a result of truth, doctrine, correct principles. Healthy growth must be in line with the truth of the word. And of course this equally has to do with service. Where, for instance, Paul says to Titus in chapter 2 and verse 1, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. And in Titus ministering, he is to minister the word. He is to hold forth the word. Speak thou things which become sound doctrine. And Paul said the same thing to Timothy. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. Nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine. There is the growth, the nourishment, as uh, the believer gets to know the Lord Jesus in the word and feeds upon him and uh, fellowships with him and uh, the result and looks to him and 
concentrates upon him, gets to know him through the word. The result is that the Christian is nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine. It must be a truth. The Holy Spirit can only honor and can only use truth and correct doctrine. That is, he's the spirit of truth, and he will not deviate from that truth. He will not work according to our ideas, according to what we according to what we want and think. We have to find out what he has said in the Word, what he has written, and uh, line up with the truth, and thereby receiving the benefit of the truth, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partaker of the divine nature. And then he, Paul says to Timothy, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. Actually, he could have said obtained. We don't attain anything in our Christian life, any uh, goal or progress is not attained by us. Actually, it is obtained as we receive as branches from the vine, as we abide in him. We obtain, we are given, we receive our daily life and development and growth. But what Paul is saying to Timothy is that as he does grow, um, that truth that has become a part of his life, that he understands and uh, rests in and receives the benefit of, that is the truth that he can actually share. That is the truth that the Holy Spirit will minister through his life and ministry. It's a principle, it's a fact that we cannot lead someone beyond the point of our development, cannot take some far, someone farther than we ourselves have gone, actually. The Holy Spirit honors and uses that which is real in our lives. And of course, we might preach and we might say things far in advance of our own development, but uh, true ministry is sharing, not standing before a group or someone and preaching so much as it is a sharing. And the individual to whom one ministers or the individuals they will be uh, conscious of the fact that we are sharing. They'll realize that we are speaking of something that is real to us and that has been proven in our lives. And this will cause them to be more ready to receive, whereas if they sense that one is simply uh, talking saying things that one has heard or one has studied about, uh, there is a barrier created because the individual thinks that there is reality there. And Paul is telling Timothy that he'll be a good minister of the Lord Jesus Christ when he's nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine whereunto he has attained or obtained. And Paul says, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. And he also said to Timothy, take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this thou shalt make sure of thy own salvation and of them that hear thee. And a Christian has to know where he stands and why and how. And he has to... speak from that which has become real to him in his own life. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine, and continue in them. The hungry-hearted, growing Christian, the developing Christian, the maturing Christian, is the one who continually has something to share. Oh, it's, it's so hard, for instance, for a leader or pastor who has to minister twice on the Lord's Day, week in, week out, year in, year out. 
and probably once or twice during the week a formal ministry to say nothing of sharing in other ways and uh, the situation where the man may not be growing to any great extent or may feel that he has pretty much arrived now that he's in the ministry and has a church and all that his ministry of necessity goes far far beyond his growth after a few years often and this is a pathetic condition and of course the people in the church suffer from this condition so that it's important for one to grow and to share that which he is developing in so that service is built upon growth and that both growth and service have to do with truth with doctrine with the principles that are set forth in the word and now we must approach our subject of uh, discipleship a disciple is one who is in fellowship with and following the Lord Jesus one who is learning of him a disciple is discipleship is for the hungry Christian all Christians should be disciples many Christians aren't ready to be disciples at least disciples upon the Lord's terms which are extremely rigid so that one may hunger to be a disciple one may hunger to be in fellowship and to follow closely to the Lord Jesus with the Lord Jesus but one may not be yet ready and one of the basic means of becoming ready for discipleship is that one is standing upon sound doctrine as to his justification and as to his acceptance as to his completeness in the Lord Jesus that he's aware of this these truths these facts these doctrines these principles that he is thoroughly at home in Romans uh, 1 to 5 before he begins to enter into the realm of identification which is opened up in Romans 6, 7, and 8 the so-called deeper truths they're not they're deeper truths of course they're deeper than the primary basic justification birth truths they're growth truths but they're not something special they're not something extra they're just simply a natural progression of the Christian life and development they take one on into the realm of maturity but they are uh, geared with and predicated upon the basic truth is that if one is weak and uh, not unsure, if one is unsure of the basic truths, he can never, never enter into the deeper truths. The deeper truths are opened up to the extent that one is solid in the primary truths of justification and his security in the Lord Jesus Christ and his acceptance in him, his completeness in him. And this, uh, th this is the foundation for uh, discipleship. And of course, a Christian has to be conditioned for this, and he is conditioned for discipleship through failure, where he has found out that he cannot of himself live the Christian life, he cannot serve God acceptably, he cannot walk acceptably, acceptably that he has uh, come down to the bottom of uh, Romans 7, so to speak, where he realizes that there's no good thing in him and that he's simply a wretched one in himself and that he must have the Lord Jesus as his very life in his daily walk in order to function at all. It must be this realization built, this need created, this hunger created through failure then one is ready to approach the realm of discipleship and if we turn to Luke 9:23 we can get a picture of the Lord Jesus um, 
what he has set forth as discipleship. Luke 9.23 And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. He said unto them all, the discipleship is not something special. It's simply a healthy, normal advance and the growth. And every Christian should be brought to this realm. Perfectly narrow, normal, natural progression. He said unto them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. And is it not true that after a time when we're first Christians that we everything is so wonderful and um, we're so in love with the Lord Jesus? He's so real and wonderful to us and He's holding our hand, so to speak, and we're just having a wonderful time with Him. We want everyone else to get to know Him. And we're busy serving Him and rejoicing in Him. But then uh, after a time when it's time to begin to grow up and leave the baby stage, it seems as though the Lord Jesus uh, lets go of our hand and he steps out in front and he sets his face as a flint toward uh, his goal for us. And his attitude becomes uh, quite um, firm. And we feel that he's saying to us, now I'm going on to your goal, my goal for you, and you are to follow me if you wish. It's up to you. I'm going. If you want to come, well, uh, follow me. And we're quite upset about this at first. This is uh, a little more than we bargained for. The baby days were so wonderful, so easy, so grand. And this is becoming a little more difficult. There is being a little bit asked of us here. And some of us hadn't bargained for this especially if we were brought to the Lord through all sorts of uh, promises and that, oh, you'll be successful now and happy and the Lord will give you everything you need and want. And we came to Him on that basis. Well, this is a, quite a turn of events. This uh, is something we hadn't thought of. And often it's a little difficult for one to make up one's mind about this. But the Lord understands all about this and He knows how to bring us on. So He says to them all, If any man will come after Me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow Me. And there is the element of denying oneself. And only the Christian who has gone through a certain amount of failure <clears throat> and a certain amount of realization of what self is like, the old life. Is he going to be willing to deny himself? Is he going to be willing to uh, follow after the Lord Jesus no matter what it costs? So that there has to be the conditioning before the Christian will be ready to follow him. And of course, when it comes to taking up the cross daily, then he does have to mean business because the cross means death. Cross means crucifixion. That's the only purpose of a cross. And the actual truth of this, the actual outworking, the how of this taking up one's cross, we are going to touch on as we move along. And of course the Lord Jesus says to follow me. That means that he's going on ahead, so to speak. He's going to be leading He's going to be taking us someplace. <clears throat> and we are to follow. Of course we're abiding in Him. We're a branch and we're... Uh, he's our life and there is a relationship of nature there. But at the same time, there is this element of following as we abide. And if we can turn to Luke 14, verse 26, we can see even more clearly what his discipleship consists of. Luke 14, verse 26. <clears throat> if
If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. And certainly this is a new realm. This is a much stiffer realm. This, uh, the Lord Jesus certainly uh, is meaning business here when he is this firm with one. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children, brother and sisters, and his own life also. And this word hate, um, <clears throat> of course we know it just doesn't stand as it is, hate uh, one's uh, parents and one's loved ones because the word never contradicts itself and we know very well that we are to love everyone and especially those of our own and uh, the Lord's own. So it certainly doesn't mean to simply hate them. But it is a term it is a term that uh, is relative that the Lord Jesus is to be so first in our lives that we are to love him so especially that it is it were as though we hated everyone else it's a contrasting term our love for him is so to be so out in front of everyone else everything else so centered in him that it would be as though we hated all else but of course we are to love everyone but our love for him is so special so intense so concentrated that it is far beyond our love for everyone else and this this is what he says it must be this way or we cannot be his disciple a, di a discipleship demands this it's going to take this for what he has to take us through in our development, in our growth, and in our service, we have to love him to that extent in order to follow him uh, uh, through what, uh, that which he'll lead us. And again he mentions, Whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. And there is the matter of cross-bearing. And of course the ministry of the cross in the life of the Christian has to do basically with uh, dealing with the old life, dealing with self where the work of the cross holds the self-life in the place of death, inoperative, puts it out of business as we count it and rest upon the facts, the finished work of the cross. This we're going to go into later on, but it is extremely essential, it's basic for the life of discipleship, of one's learning to bear the cross. And it's a matter, it's a daily matter. Take up his cross daily. Whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So, so likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. And it doesn't mean that we're to throw everything away, not have anything, but it does mean that he is to be first in all things, far and above, infinitely beyond everything else. That Nothing will hold us down, nothing will keep us from him forsaking things in that way allowing nothing to take hold of us and no one to take hold of us when it comes to our following him in discipleship but of course he will never include in his discipleship the following uh, our following him he will never include in that uh, a violation of our responsibilities, for instance, and family responsibilities, that uh, so often it has happened, especially in certain circles where there are those who have left their husband or wife and gone out to serve the Lord, for instance, or left their family, forsaken their own. God does not call for that. There are certain principles of home life and family life for instance, responsibilities that God does not violate. He works things out so that these are maintained and at the same time one is a disciple. 
God does not work against himself and he does not uh, counteract his own principles and doctrines. He doesn't have to to gain his objectives because uh, there are no cross purposes with God. Everything in the word is laid out perfectly and he doesn't have to cut any corners. He does not have to contradict himself in any way. So we see that the cross is actually, we're going to see that the cross is actually the key to uh, the Christian life, discipleship. The absolute key, the very core of everything to do with the Christian life. And the only Christians, the only believers who are able to to see the truths of the cross and enter into these truths are those who have been conditioned and conditioned through failure. Once a Christian begins to see these identification truths and the truths of the cross and he seeks to share them, for instance, that's so wonderful to him, he's astounded at uh, the few Christians who are even interested and the Christians who will oppose uh, the truth and uh, wonder why he's getting all excited about this and why he's so interested in this. Many uh, many leaders, many most pastors, most leaders um, will oppose the Christian as he enters this realm, as he seeks to share. And it's surprising for the individual that the opposition that he encounters where he least expected it. Uh, but that's simply because so few at any one time are conditioned and ready for discipleship, for the truths of the cross. And we can spend a little time here thinking of this fact of the cross, about one's taking up the cross, for instance, we can touch on this subject a bit here. <clears throat> there is, of course, the fact about the cross that every Christian is familiar with, and that is concerning his new birth, concerning his justification, that he finally came to see that in Adam the first he was lost and uh, dead in trespasses and sins and he became uh, convicted of his sin and sinfulness and he sought to uh, struggle to get relief from this conviction and to be a better person and maybe earn his way to heaven and to be accepted, acceptable to God and there was this struggle but finally Finally, he came to realize that uh, it was no use. He could not produce. And he had to look away to the Lord Jesus Christ to save him. And he saw that the Lord Jesus Christ bore his sins and paid for his sin on the cross of Calvary. And the cross became very real to the new Christian because it was there that the Lord Jesus paid for his sins. There the Lord Jesus died for him so that he uh, ceased from his struggling and he began to rest in the finished work of Calvary. And he found peace by the blood of the cross where the Lord Jesus shed his blood in payment for atonement for his sin. And the cross in the life of the Lord Jesus became very precious to him. And he was born again because of the work of the cross because of the one who did that work. And that was his uh, introduction to the initial truth of the cross, of substitution, birth, justification. But now the believer, when it comes to sanctification, beyond justification, when it comes beyond the birth truths to the growth truths, then the Christian has to learn something about the cross once again. Actually the same principles, but a deeper truth. He, uh, 
he is moving from substitution to identification. He's moving from the first five chapters of Romans, actually, he's the doctrine. He's moving into the doctrine of Romans 6, 7, and 8, for instance, the identification truths. And as he's prepared and as he's ready, and as he's ready for discipleship, he will be brought into this realm. And the same thing happens to him again for sanctification as happened to him for justification. He's been struggling, maybe it's a matter of years, to be a better Christian and to overcome the self-life and to overcome sin and to serve God and to live for God. And there's been a struggle. And finally he comes to realize that it's a futile struggle. And he's convicted, uh, not this time of his sins that he might go to hell. Now he's convicted of his sinfulness. He's concerned not about his sins that uh, were paid for. He's concerned about himself, who is a sinner, as a Christian. He's concerned about the, the sinfulness of his own heart, where all these sins in his life are springing from. He's concerned about the fact that he's a sinner. And he struggled maybe for years to overcome the old life and to cause it to be Christian and to be good. But he has finally had to cry out, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me? And um, as he comes to this place at the bottom of Romans 7, he, it finally dawns upon him that he has to depend upon another source, that he has to be a branch and depend upon the vine. That he truly has to recognize the Lord Jesus as his life, his everyday life. And he does not have to produce a Christian life, but he uh, receives the Christian life as a branch. So, under these conditions, the Holy Spirit points the Christian back to the cross, where he sees that the Lord Jesus did not only die for his sins in substitution, but the Lord Jesus took him, the sinner, up on the cross with him, and that he, the sinner, died unto sin in the Lord Jesus. He, the sinner, the one who produces all the sins, was taken down to death. Not only his sins, but him, the sinner. He, the sinner was identified with the Lord Jesus Christ. Everyone who would ever believe in the Lord Jesus, who would ever become a Christian, every single one was placed by God uh, back on the cross at Calvary, placed in the Lord Jesus, when he was made to be sin for us, our sin. We were placed in him, identified with him. And when the Lord Jesus uh, was crucified and died, we died in him, and we were buried in him. And we arose in him as new creations in Christ Jesus. We think of Galatians 2.20 where I have been crucified with him and it is no longer I that live but Christ liveth in me. And we, as we enter the area of Romans 6 this will be pictured for us and brought out in doctrine very clearly, very wonderfully. But this uh, we see that uh, the cross of the Lord Jesus is our cross. That is where we died. There is where the finished work was uh, set forth and worked out. And um, as we see this truth later on, we will learn to rest in that truth. And we will learn to take that finished work by faith, take up that cross that took us down into death, and this finished work will be applied to our lives right here and now today by the Holy Spirit, where he will bring the finished work of the cross into our lives and he will apply that death to the old self-life. And it will be held inoperative. It will be held, put out of business as we rest in that finished work, as we count it so, as we reckon it so. And we will get the benefit of that death in our walk here where self will be held in the place of death and will be free to walk in the Lord Jesus, be free to walk in the Spirit. And uh, it'll be not I more and more progressively, but Christ. 
and that is the key. The cross is the key. We've struggled for years, for instance, to overcome self, but as we finally realize it cannot be done, self will never cast out self. Self can never overcome sin. That <coughs> we have to apply to the cross, and we find out that the work was already done at Calvary. And again, we are able to rest in a finished work, just as we did in our justification, when we were all tired out and all battered about in our struggle and effort to be and to do, we finally found the wonderful rest of the finished work for justification. And the same thing happens again for our sanctification. We finally come to the place to see it, where we see that the work was done at Calvary. And again we apply to Calvary, again we take up our cross, and we begin to gain the benefit of the finished work of the cross in our daily walk. We think of Colossians 3.3 3, where Paul says, For ye are dead. We died at Calvary. For ye are dead. <clears throat> and your life is hid with Christ in God. Christ who is our life. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And this is the wonderful truth of identification that we're simply touching on here. We will advance into it as we move along. Our Father, we trust Thee to have each one of us prepared as we approach these wonderful truths of identification, that our hearts will be prepared, that we will uh, be hungry, that we will be open with open face beholding in the word that which thou hast for us. Oh, we rejoice in thy faithfulness to us, and we look to thee as we move along in thy truth. We thank thee in advance for all that thou hast done for us in the Lord Jesus, and we thank thee in his precious name. Amen.